Welcome, everybody. This is Books Cafe presented by free-ebooks.net. I'm your host, Scott Patton, president of free-ebooks.net. And I'm so excited to have you join us. And I'm very excited about our guest. Before I bring him on, though, I want to uh, give you a quick look at our website. You can get five books a month free. No... Uh, no cost that's what free means and we've got our featured books we've got categories like oh my goodness mystery classics and you know romance <clears throat> we've got academia books we've got textbooks uh, we've got all sorts of different types of nonfiction, and it's we've tried to be like <clears throat> this library of forty thousand uh free books for you and everything that you could want we've also taken a little bit of time and figured out who, what we think are some of our best books. Of course, that's totally subjective. And we've got lists. So if you're a zombie uh, reader, then we've got the list for you. If you love humor, we've got, to, we've got a series of books like on that. And then, of course, our editors are hard at work with our authors, helping them to get their books up on our sites as fast as possible. And in addition, we have audiobooks. So and then we got our, our blog. And if our blog, we post all of our live streams. Here's the one I did this morning with Kiera Vale. And you're able to go there and watch anything that you think you've missed. And it's free. Just put your email in and say, I want free ebooks. If you're an author, check the author uh, tick box there. If you're not an author, please don't tick it. And if we can support you in any way, we'd be delighted to do that. So that's our... Uh, that's our site. That's who makes this show possible. And with that, I want to introduce our guest today. He's a comedy writer, and he's written a number of excellent comedy books. And because sometimes with comedy, uh, it might be maybe a little politically incorrect for some people, he's decided that he's going to show his true face, as you can see, as you can see there right now. I always point in the wrong direction. And it's a reminder of the importance for writers to not be afraid to offend because it's an it's important to make non-politically correct points. If we don't have people challenging our thoughts and our beliefs, we'll just end up continuing down a road which, you know, in the last 50 years has been pretty much towards ruin when you look at the wars, when you look at the poverty, when you look at population explosion, climate change, uh, and just looking around your neighborhood and thinking, wow, you know, it could be a lot better if we did things different. And by doing the same thing over and over again, we're not going to be making change. And by having non-PC viewpoints expressed, uh, there's this, so this is my little editorial, I think it makes a huge difference. So he says, humor needs to remain unfiltered and unapologetic. Even back in 2013, doing a guest blog, he argued against the direction of PC humor. And now we've seen it. You can't go to campuses today. Uh, they're banning people that have opinions different than the established PC opinion of the university. So he's a big believer in the importance of the self-publisher and fighting the trend towards censorship. Of course, if we can publish our own stuff then and, and do our own shows like this, we become the... Uh, the editor, we become the publisher, we become the final say in what goes into it, and we can express ourselves fully. When you have to, I mean, you just watch the TV news, and it's the same old thing over and over again. They're parroting the party line, whatever that happens to be, and they're not really spending any time talking about what they really believe or really think. So with that, welcome to the show, Lance Mannion. How are you today? Oh, just a sec. Unmute you. There you go. <laughs> You'll probably regret that. <laughs> Keep your finger I on have the control. I have the mute button. <laughs> no, I'm doing good. I appreciate you uh, letting me have a few minutes. That's, it's my pleasure. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of your books. Uh, and I, Well, first of all, how did you get into writing? Why did you decide you wanted to write about comedy? And, uh, and let's just start there. Sure. And again, just as a, as a caveat, when you say comedy, um, my first few books lean very heavily towards that and probably over the years have gotten uh, less funny and, and more quirky. Um, and mm. 
become more and more self-indulgent. Um, it started out wildly self-indulgent, which was, you know, back in the MySpace days, keeping a page um, to keep friends updated because I didn't really have the time or interest in making phone calls or writing letters. Right. Actually, all of them were replaced by people who thought it was, you know, interesting to read other rants by strangers until I just created a new one under this name um, that eventually grew into, uh, you know, to nine books and counting. Wow. So it's tell us a little Go well, ahead. I, I was going to say it, um, it's a lot like the, the movie Seven, where, where the bad guy, they find all his volumes of ramblings. Um, oh, yes. When I saw that, I'm like, boy, if he could, you know, if it would just been 10 or 15 years later, he could have self-published and probably not, you know, felt the need to murder people. Oh, that's an interesting point. It's our expression takes a little bit of the charge off of it. If it has nowhere to go, then it could be constructive, but more likely we see it being destructive. Yeah, I, th I think all writing to a certain degree is, is more of, a, of an exorcism of sorts, just, you know, getting things out of your head and putting them down so you can move on with your life. Oh, that's a wonderful way to put it. Let's talk about a couple of your books. And I happen to have up here next. And so it's easy. For, so you don't have to try and read it, everybody. It The description is a collection of short stories isn't really a book. It's more like dozens of ideas that could have been books if they were thought of by someone with a better attention span. I love that line. To put it another way, if you took an infinite number of Shakespeare's and put them in front of an infinite number of typewriters with an infinite amount of time, they still wouldn't come up with the complete works of Lance Mannion. To put it yet another way, you can throw down manure to feed crops. Just imagine this book has manure, not too great a stretch, and your imagination is the crops. If you don't understand the metaphor, then this book probably isn't for you. So what? Uh, tell us a little bit about the short stories in the book. Well, they're... Originally, they, they were attempts at, at being catalysts for greater ideas. The idea behind, you know, the, the whole self-publishing revolution is, you know, to inspire somebody else to write something. So mm. purposely try to keep things around a thousand words. I try to have some sort of, you know, image that I want to evoke, some sort of emotion, but keep it vague. And, and ideally, at the end of it, you know, have the reader say, well, that was okay, but I have this better, you know, idea. He could have gone this direction or that direction and then, you know, eventually get off their ass themselves and, and start writing. Nice. That's awesome. So can you, sh can you share, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot anyway. Can you share <laughs> a couple ideas from the book that, uh, that were, you were particularly fond of? Um, well, because um, I actually had picked up the uh, Tales of Adventure with, with Nap Lapkin, um, I'll, I'll talk about that. Oh, that let's was, move on. Let's move on to that book because I wanted to talk about that one as well. Well, because I always feel like such a schlub when when I don't remember what stories were in next, but I do remember because this is the last one, and, and you're going to have me read something, so I actually flipped through it. Um, this, this is your latest book, right? Yeah, and, and this is the only reoccurring character in any of mine. I think in all nine books, there's probably about 430 stories, give or take. Wow. This is the only reoccurring character. And it really is somebody that I, I just love because it, it can be completely silly. He can be completely serious. He has all of the, you know, the, the male chauvinistic tendencies that any male writer likes to dig into. There's the, you know, the attractive redhead um, that, you know, that there's a constant tension and lust. And you just throw him in scenarios uh, in, in this book. Um, he has to fight a, a sentinel comet, that, a comet that's coming towards Earth. So he has to get into a, a rocket and go have a communication. He has to hunt down and kill a dragon mascot that has turned into a real dragon and is eating other mascots <laughs> to do battle with vampiric Dick Clark, which explains why he remains so useful. Um, it's just, ah. but at the same time, it allows me to, you know, explore a lot of, uh, you know, different stereotypes and, and, and archetypes in my head. Wow. And you have a lot of fun with that. 
I do. He's the only one that I, I would say actually makes me laugh out loud. And in, in the introduction to this book, I, uh, and I don't know if you have that there, but it's, it's sort of funny. Uh, he, is, he illustrates the limitations I have as a writer. Anytime I write a Map Lapkin story, I realize on my best day, I'm a mediocre writer. And, and I'm constantly refer referencing other writers that, that are, you know, amazing and, and professional and sort of mocking my attempts because he really does illustrate all of those limitations in trying to communicate just how kick-ass he is. Mm, interesting. Interesting way to, to look at that. Now, are not authors their own worst critics? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> Anybody who's read my books knows that's not the case. Um, I, I think it really comes down to you know, what you're trying to accomplish. If I was trying to be a real author, uh, and by that I mean, you know, sell a million copies, earn a living from it, you know, book, do book tours and, and, and be dishing out advice on, on writing, then I certainly would, you know, be up at night, you know, taking a look at, at how I approach it. But because this is more of a, uh, a hobby, um, I don't really, you know, I'm not too critical of it. Um, I, I, I tend to be bored stiff by my own writing once it's done. So mm. I went back and read it. I would be, you know, completely embarrassed that that I actually published it. But I'm always moving on to the next book. So I, I don't have that issue. So you don't have to look back. You don't look back yeah. then you... Right. Oh, drives my, uh, which explains why my editor spends most of her time banging her head against the uh, the desk. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your writing process. Um, and the, if as long as I can throw all sorts of asterisks saying this is not a great way to be creative, this is not a great way to write. Take zero advice from this. But in reality, um, it's really simple. It can be like I can get three interesting ideas in one day or it can be a week between them. Um, I just sit down and try to write a thousand words as quickly as possible and mm. never think about it again, which, may say, which means a lot of the things come off incomplete. But the interesting thing is when I go back, you know, and, and then I post it and I read it, it's always, it comes out different than I intended in, in a really cool way. This oh. is, you know, sort of just a diary uh, of sorts, uh, trying to work things out. And, and it, you know, I, I'm always impressed by the, the subconscious. Yes. That, that writing is an, an amazing way to explore that. Once you force yourself to write down, you know, some crazy idea or some, um, I, I love quotes um, from other people. I love to misquote people. Uh, I, I love, you know, coming up with alternate histories and, and alternate realities. And when you do that, you're not even aware when you're writing what the point is. It's not till you're done, you look back and say, wow, I didn't realize I was wrestling with that. Or, you know, boy, I really am a, a dumbass when it comes to this particular subject. Um, and I think from what you said earlier, you know, when you, when you have to write PC and when you're worried about what people think, you're really handcuffing yourself. Yes. And, you know what I love about the self-publishing and and being able to now just have your own website, post what you want, not give a rat's red ass what people think. It allows you to be wrong. It allows you to be stupid. And I think that that's what's you know to blame. Is, and I've mentioned a couple of times why our cities are burning because this whole whole woke culture and all this virtue signaling crap is really just taking away people's ability to explore their own, you know, uh, shortcomings, to explore their own biases uh, and, and, and try things on, say things out loud that may or may not be correct, um, but, but need some thought and, and need some expression. And right now everybody's ass is so puckered tight, afraid they, they'll say the wrong thing, that I think, you know, that that's when the negative stuff comes. That's when the repressed things start coming. And, I, and that's where the, the website, to me, is just awesome. It's, it's an outlet to say all the rude, stupid, sexist, racist, horrible things that, that slosh around everybody's head, vocalize them, throw a light on them, and I think grow and, and learn really interesting lessons about yourself, you know, not even other people, um, as you express it. 
And that's why, you know, when, when you'd mentioned, you know, the, the whole woke culture and this, you know, the, the censorship culture, um, I, I think it's just a, a terrible thing because I, I think you need to be able to have conversations and have the right to be wrong and then look back on it and say, you know, that was stupid or that was offensive or that was insensitive. You know, maybe I will now go back and change, you know, how I approach that situation. And you're really talking about a level of self-awareness that I think is becoming lower and lower and lower, unfortunately, like people are less and less self-aware. And the only way you can find out, like the only way we can find out who we are is by having things occur that we then afterwards go, well, wow, that's, uh, I didn't really like the way I was in that situation or wow, I really dealt with that in a way that I didn't know that I could. I mean, it's, it, it's a good thing. It can be a good insight. Or it can be a bad insight, right? It's not, it's not necessarily one way or the other. And growing up in the 60s, I can remember people arguing against political correctness even then. So I think this is something that probably if you went back centuries and centuries and centuries, there's always been the in the day of the saber-toothed tiger, someone saying, oh, you know, we don't want to make the saber-toothed tiger extinct, so stop hunting it. And, and uh, well, you, you know, mentioned, you know, that back in the '60s, you know, the the great irony was that you know some of the um, the most iconic places that those conversations took place, like Berkeley, are now like ground zero for you know censorship. So yeah. they were fighting the power. It was they were completely behind. The idea of free expression, but once they became the power, they've been ten times as oppressive as you know, as as they consider the right wing or the conservative viewpoint. So it's uh, it, it is troubling because you know, as someone who who straddles the line from a political perspective, you know, I think there's you know pros and cons to to both parties and and both approaches. Uh, I find it very distressing that you know people are pushed to one extreme or the other, and and the middle. Right has disappeared almost entirely. It sure feels like the middle has disappeared. Part of what you were talking about reminded me of one of my favorite dearly departed comedians. Um, oh no, I have his face in my head and I can't get his name out. Um, but he Bill was, Hicks. what's that? Bill Hicks? No, but you're close. Uh, uh, oh dear. I want to say Carson, but that's not, a, that's not right. George Carlin? George Carlin, yes. And oh, yeah. I remember about two weeks ago, I was, it just popped up on my face, not my Facebook feed, my uh, my YouTube homepage. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll listen to him. And I'm listening to him, and he is like ripping apart society. And I'm not necessarily disagreeing with him. And everybody's laughing. And I'm thinking, you know, if you really listen, there's no joke here. <laughs> He's just, like really going after the politically correct and and how we're doing things and and I thought it's isn't it funny that you have to be labeled a comedian and go someplace where everybody laughs at what you say but when you really think about it like it's pretty serious what he's talking you know what he's talking about we should be discussing it and thinking about it and changing oh, I, I couldn't agree more I mean I think you know you look at every culture every civilization you know back in the gesture days the, the comedy played a really important role, and, and that role was, you know, to be corrosive to the, the power structure, to yeah. attack it and to mock it. And, you know, what, what troubles me is, you know, I see George Carlin quotes on both sides, and, and I just want to strangle the people and say, if he was alive today, he would think you're all a bunch of schmucks. You yes. Know, if I, the bottom line is, you know, I, I I wrote something in 2013 criticizing The Daily Show, which, of course, made me wildly unpopular. But as I see it today, Trevor uh, Noah is the least funny person who's ever walked the planet. He doesn't, you know, it would be amazingly easy to be a writer on The Daily Show because you don't actually have to be funny anymore. All you have to do is throw red meat to one side of the, of the political aisle and, and attack people and 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 I think that, you know, the, the responsibility that they gave up back in two thir 2013 with Jon Stewart and, and Stephen Colbert is they they wanted to be intellectuals. They wanted to be considered bright instead of just being, you know, comedians and to doing what's in mm. society, which is to constantly tear things down. 
You know, Saturday right. Night Live is guilty of that. They're 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 way far on one side, and yet the sacred cows on you know that they agree with, they let them walk. And right. So a comedy needs to attack everybody evenly. You know, ream everybody evenly, and and that's real. That way, everybody can laugh at themselves and at their opinions. You remind me of All in the Family. You, you don't remind me of All in the Family, but what you're talking about reminds me of All in the Family and how it was so successful because the right-wing extremist rednecks were laughing at the left-wing extremist intellectuals that were both uh, on the show, right? The father and the son-in-law. and. Uh, each side could see the other side and laugh at that. And that's, ex I think, exactly what you were kind of talking about. Yeah, like, I mean, it, and this is a little cliche, but, you know, a movie like Blazing Saddles could never be made today. And yet it's right. one of the most iconic and one of the funniest, because like you said, there's something there for everybody. You know, there, there's something and, and, and almost a self-awareness, you know, when, when they're talking about the, the racism and such, you're mocking their attitudes, you're mocking the humor and you're sort of learning and growing from it. But now everything has to be couched in such a way that nobody is offended. And it's like, screw you, everybody should be offended at least once a week. It's healthy, you know? Yes. My fan mail, I get offended uh, at least two or three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really good point. And if you're offended or if I'm offended, then I I have two up. I have an opportunity, and I can take it or not. One is like, why was I so triggered by whatever it was, and then that gives me a chance for an internal dialogue and and get insights and find out more about me, or I can just be offended and and nothing changes. And I think very rarely in these in today's society, the people sit down and say like, wow, like I was really upset about something. Like a friend of mine used to always say, you're never mad for the reason you think, right? So I always, whenever I get mad, it's like, I go, okay, well, I think I know why I'm mad because they did that. But my friend says, I'm never mad for the reason I think, which means there's another reason I'm mad. And of course, then you, another part of the layer of the onion comes off and probably another one and another one and another one, depending on how far you want to take it. But Well, and that's, you know, that, that you know, as we, as we close the circle, that is... Uh, the purpose of, of either stand-up comedy, whether it be lecture tours or, in my case, writing, is just doing that. You know, having people uh, read something that that isn't biased one way or the other. Uh, I, I, I really try, although it gets hard to, at times, to just be vague and dumb and and just, you know, say what I'm thinking using metaphors and analogies so everybody can walk away with from every story, however, you know, simplistic it may be with some sort of uh, emotion. Right. And, and I think, you know, tying that back to, you know, the importance of, of your site and self-publishing, um, I get asked sometimes, you know, why I do this. Nobody buys my books. Nobody visits the website. This is, you know, complete obscurity, um, intentional. And I just hearken back to, um, there's a college radio station I listen to, WPRB in Princeton all the time. And I'll be driving late at night or early in the morning, and a song will come on that I've never heard before. I will never hear it again from a band that I've never heard of. And for those three and a half or four minutes, it's I'm feeling transcendent. It's evoking mm. something and making me feel something. And then I look back and I say, well, if somebody somewhere in the, in the world hadn't have written that song, then got a group together to play it, then spent time and money to record it, send it out to Princeton. All of these holistic things needed to happen to connect with me in my car driving at that point in time. And I think that the, you know, the, the, the self-publishing and the free eBooks is just such a great resource to allow people, nobody's gonna be a Lance Mannion fan. I mean, I, I, I'm very self-aware of that, but maybe they read one story one day that resonates with them, that moves them in some way, or just makes them laugh or shake their fist in my general direction. Um, but we've connected, you know, right. through, through all the time and the space. And I think that you know anybody who's on the fence about writing or publishing something that they've written, I would say get the hell off the fence. 
you're, you're not going to be Dan Brown. You're not going to sell a million copies. But what you are going to do is, A, have a feeling of, of you created something, and B, yes. you're going to connect with people. That's beautiful, Lance. Thank you for sharing that. And we're getting close to the end of our time together. And I just, and I was going to ask you about, you know, the going back to the importance of self-publishing and you've pretty much answered, you know, tied a bow on it. So is there any last, uh, last words you'd like to share, whether words of inspiration for someone who's thinking about writing a book or has written a book and maybe uh, has a couple non-fans give them some uh, feedback or anything else in the world that you want to talk about doesn't necessarily have to be, <laughs> has well, to be I, I there's i hate you know pretentious and and, and self-absorbed authors so i say all of this with the caveat of um i sound much brighter than i am and and you know you may be really impressed with this conversation head to my website and then go holy crap he's terrible but the point, which is um, doing it is, that's the point in itself, whether people appreciate it, whether you get recognition, has to be um, an aside. It has to be something that you truly enjoy doing. You're not looking for, you know, accolades and people to lift you on their shoulder and carry you around the room. It's, it, it's true self-expression. There are a lot of formats. I mean, um, free eBooks, when, when, when I publish on you guys, I hit click, a couple hours later it's published, and then a couple hours later there's a thousand or more downloads. And it's nice. able to reach people like that is, is just, you know, it's just, it, it's a gift. So take advantage of it. Some people may even, you know, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, you had to send it into these monolithic companies that would reject you unless, you know, they knew you went to Harvard or Yale or, you know, they were friends with somebody. They, they dominated the industry. Yes. A matter of hours. And it's so easy. You can actually have a voice and contribute that little one drop of water in the ocean of literature and find an audience. So, I mean, I would just say that there's no reason not to. I mean, it, it's amazing how easy it is. And it's amazing how many people are out there who are interested in, you know, that character from Seven, um, you know, reading the journal and, and, and connecting with them. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I've come to realize there's an infinite appetite for reading. Or, you know, you could be watching, reading, listening. Uh, it just it just seems like there's, it's, I think what the, my problem with it is I can't really get my head around 7.7 .7 billion people of which four or five billion have daily access to the internet and the rest of them have sporadic access to the internet and what that really means. And what it means is that there are millions of people around the world who would probably love reading your book, whatever book that is, whether it's your book, Lance, your books, Lance, or you know, anyone that's watching or listening to this in now or in the future, it's just, it's really hard for me to get my head around that, but it seems to be the case. Well, it's such a buzz. You, you it's very economical to set up a website. It, you know, you go through, you know, um, there's a number of platforms. Um, and then after a couple months, you know, you look and, and you'll say, you know, th there were 14 countries that, you know, that went to my website today. And then every once in a while, there'll be this weird anomaly that was, you know, a couple of years back, I had like 400 views in Germany one day. The next day it went back to like zero or one. I'll never know why, who mentioned it, how they mentioned it. But to me, it's just, it's, it's just awesome. And I really encourage everybody to do that because there's nothing cooler than to realize that somewhere else, you know, in some far flung corner of the world, somebody's reading what you wrote. And yes. It's a cool feeling. Isn't that, that is such a wonderful feeling. It's just like, yeah, I have somebody in Mongolia reading my book. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find out that, you know, their grasp of, uh, of, of criticism isn't as good, but you know, you figure out what they, what they meant by their horrible comments that they said. <laughs> I, what I find is uh, non first language English writers uh, it takes a while to decipher what they what they wrote for sure because wh however they translate it uh, you know 
the whole way that they think in another language is, can be very, very different than how we structure things in English. And, and so it's really kind of funny reading it and going, oh, I don't think that's what they meant, but I think this is what they meant. And, uh, and going from there, it's, it's, it's a fun experience. Well, what I find is, 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 is sort of, um, I, I, I want to put a little note because I make up a lot of words and, and jam words together um, and use very horrible English. So I almost want to put a disclaimer for those where, you know, English is second language, you know, which is don't read this to glean any insight into the English language. I'm horrible <laughs> it and, and making up words as I go. Right, right. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Lance, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been it's been a pleasure. I just really enjoyed our time together. I really like uh, your site, lancemanion.com. I encourage everybody to head over there, uh, sample some of his books. Uh, by that, I mean buy them, support them, and then send them some nice critiques about how much you enjoyed it and how it transformed your life or just that hour that you spent reading. I know uh, I appreciate it when I get wonderful comments, and I'm sure, Lance, you do too. Yeah, in theory. In theory. <laughs> I actually enjoy some of the, the – um, my favorite um, review I ever got was somebody who hated the book and just tore me a new one, and it was so much funnier than the book that I <laughs> – no habit because it was, I mean, it was somebody who was going to be a future writer. I was flattered that they, you know, they reamed me because they were hysterical in, in the way they did it. So, you know, good or bad, nice. I always enjoy the feedback. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. This is uh, Books Cafe presented by www.freeebooks.net. Head over there, get your, get your free books, get reading and uh, make sure you look for Lance when you're there. Thanks for joining us, and we'll 